Well, hi everyone, episode 18 in the new history of the human race with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen as a PhD in biology from Harvard University. And he has done a lot of research in genetics and he's been looking at all the research that's been done on the Y chromosome, which comes through the man and mutation rates and looking at research and people groups across the world has been able to identify some very fascinating uh, relationships. Now, if you've missed out on all this series, because this is episode 18, well, you can go to answers.tv, subscribe to our streaming platform. It is absolutely phenomenal. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of items on there. And of course, all of these will be on there under a particular season. You'll see them there if you subscribe to answers.tv. And if you subscribe for a year, it's just over $3 a month. So it's very, very inexpensive. You can also go to YouTube and they'll be on a playlist there. Well, Dr. Jensen, can we identify the Jews genetically? We talked about the Vikings last time. And now we're gonna talk about the Jews and if you can identify them genetically. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you run with this session. This is absolutely fascinating. You know, I never studied history that much at school. In fact, I sort of found it a bit of a, you know, slog <laughs> doing history. I was much more interested in biology and uh, that sort of thing. But this has been absolutely fascinating. I think people love history and we all want to know who we're related to and where we come from. And the world is much smaller than we think is what you've been telling us because we find those relationships show, hey, a lot of these people groups and the cultures that we think took a long time to form didn't. And we are much more closely related to them than we realize. So talk about the Jews genetically for us. I had a similar experience with a, another staff member who said, I can't stand history, but the way you're explaining it, and this, these sorts of connections I find really interesting. So those are the sorts of reactions that make my day and say, okay, I think we're onto something helpful here. And the larger question is a historical one, but one that most history books won't discuss because I haven't been able to discuss without DNA evidence. Who do we come from? History books cover politics, cultures, things you can discover with archaeology. But the question of the peoples is something only genetics can answer. And we haven't had the genetic data until recently. And we haven't had these discoveries of the, of the genetic data connecting us all and connecting us pa to past cultures until just the last couple of years. One of the most important biblical questions, of course, is who are the Jews? What's our relationship to them, their relationship to the West, rest of the world? What's their history? And can genetics confirm this, inform it, expand it? If you're a creationist, you're a Christian watching this, you might think of King David, Solomon, Saul, the prophets as the Jews when you think of them. Maybe Moses, Aaron, Tabernacle, Temple. There's so much history in scripture that deals with the Jewish people. It's a huge topic to investigate genetically. Even if you're not a creationist, a Christian watching, surely you can think of the Holocaust, other things from history. Sad history of the Jews, Nazi Germany. So for thousands of years, these people have had a tumultuous, sad, but enduring history can we find the signature of this history in their DNA? Can we go back to Moses and Aaron and Abraham and see the echo of these people and speaking of Abraham? What does DNA tell us about the relationship between the Jews and the Arabs, the Jews and the Palestinians? Can we find that connection in Abraham? Can we find something more recent? Is there more blood shared between these neighbors in one of the most explosive parts of the world than we've previously thought. Well, in 1997, mainstream publication in Nature announced Y chromosomes of Jewish priests. And of course, we've been looking at the male inherited DNA Y chromosome as the major focus in these episodes, as the major clue to understanding the history of people. And a decade later, they expanded and refined their study of their announcement of a Jewish lineage. And I wanna camp out on this momentarily because the claims are explosive. They say in this paper, it's been known for over a decade that a majority of men who self-report as members of the Jewish priesthood, the Kohanim, and you can see the Kohen name there, 
carry a characteristic Y chromosome haplotype, which is just a fancy term. Haplotype is just a fancy term for grouping. They carry a characteristic Y chromosome grouping termed the Cohen modal haplotype, Cohen grouping, essentially, the CMH. This Cohen Y chromosome grouping has been used to trace putative Jewish ancestral origins of various populations. And they say in this paper, we demonstrate that 46.1% of these self-identifying Jewish priesthood peoples carry Y chromosomes belonging to a single paternal lineage, which they call J-P58. And so that notation is simply shorthand for group J. We've talked about how letters of the alphabet that designate major divisions in this family tree and p58 is just a subdivision of it then so this paternal lineage in this grouping j likely originated in the near east well before the dispersal of the jewish groups in the diaspora so out of the middle east and around the globe to europe and so forth they say support for a near eastern origin of this particular group j lineage comes from its high frequency in our sample of bedouins which are middle, east, middle eastern nomads Yemenis, so they're on the Arabian Peninsula, and Jordanians. You can see the high frequencies there. And it's precipitous drop in frequency as one moves away from Saudi Arabia and the Near East. Moreover, there is a striking contrast between the relatively high frequency of this Group J lineage in Jewish populations and, this, and the Jewish priesthood peoples, the Kohanim, and its vanishingly low frequency in our sample of non-Jewish populations that hosted the Jewish diaspora communities outside of the Near East. And in this study, these Jewish peoples are heavily in Europe. And so their point here is, we see it at a decent concentration in these European Jews, but not in the other Europeans around them. So could this be the Jewish lineage? Is this the echo of Moses and Aaron? We're now in episode 18, so my review of the previous episodes is going to be fast and furious, but relevant to what we're discussing today. The world is smaller than we think. We're going to see this played out in living color as we discuss the Jews. That was episode one. Episode two shows through the math of our family trees that we're more connected than we think. We'll also see today what we illustrated and explored in episode three, that ethnic change happens faster than we think. And this means that with in, in combination with reproductive rates and small differences in that, episode four, that the ancestry of a people group today can be very different than what they thought historically. We saw in episodes five and six, our family tree is much more shallow than we think it's shorter. This is gonna be especially relevant today. The, the major conclusion we were driving towards in episode six was that the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome, is the key to human history. It's inherited imperfectly every generation. It acts like a clock and so that the number of differences between you and I, between people groups around the globe, is a record then of how closely related or distantly related they are. If Ken and I have a few number of Y chromosome differences between us, we have a recent common ancestor. If we have many Y chromosome differences, we have a distant common ancestor. We'll apply that principle around the globe and you discover lost relatives of Europe. We saw this in episode seven. They're in India and in the Middle East and in Central Asia. In episode eight, we saw that the Mongol Empire and its aftermath is the explanation like the explanation for this. Episode nine, we saw that on the Y chromosome tree, there's an ancient Chinese connection to Eastern Europe. Surprising because of the longstanding isolation of the Chinese culture. Episode 10 looked at the history of Western Europe and then by extension, the Americas. We found out that the hidden history of Americans and of Western Europeans goes back to Central Asia in the AD era likely 8900 and forward was a, was a movement of peoples into Europe from Central Asia. Then by episode 11, we began to turn the page to pre-Columbian history before the Europeans arrived and saw that even in mainstream archeology, span there's major changes happening. Genetics was brought to this question in episode 12. We saw a bombshell discovery that today's Native Americans were not the first. And in episode 13, we saw that this might actually have been recorded in the oral and written histories of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. We saw that genetics also has tremendous relevance to long-standing archeological explanations and history for the, Amer for the indigenous Americans, like the Mayans. And these people who came over in the AD era might have been responsible for wiping the Mayans out and the collapse of that civilization in the, in the early AD era, the 900s or so. We've also seen that genetics reveals a connection between today's Native Americans and modern Europeans. That connection is Central Asia because that's the population 
from which both of these people groups trace their descent. Well, who were the first Americans? That was episode 16. And they may have something to do with the ancient Pacific and Australia. Last time we saw and looked at the question of what happened to the Vikings and the chances that you and I might be descendants of them. Today, we want to look at the question of the Jews and go back to this study, initially in 1997, then in 2009, the claim that we can find a very characteristic Y chromosome lineage, haplotype being the fancy term for grouping. I want to start to explore this study with this particular uh, exploration of people groups around the globe, the, not the Thousand Genomes Project that looked at the Y chromosomes of where the people are, rather this study that did a much broader sampling of the geographic sampling of peoples of the globe. Fewer people in each group, but more groups total. And I want to do this one because they actually looked at, shown here in red, Middle Eastern lineages, which is the focus then of this purported Jewish lineage. This is group J, which is the one to which this Jewish study, the Jews in the study belonged. Let's zoom in here to see who's present. It's not just Middle Eastern peoples. We'll look at the frequency of this group around the globe momentarily. But zoom in here just so you can see in this study who's present. You've got Iranians. You've got some Central Asians there, light green, Kyrgyzstan. Other groups may not be so familiar. You do have a few Indians, South Asians, shown there, Kapu. You've got Assyrians, Georgians. Some of these might not be so familiar. Some are Abkhazians. You've got people of the Caucasus region there, those, that mountainous region between uh, South modern Russia and Iraq, Iran, and so forth. Jordanians, Armenians, some are more familiar. You've got Mumbai Jews. You've got uh, other Caucasus peoples, Azerbaijanis, Armenians. There's some more Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabians, Jordanians again, just to give you a flavor of who's there. Some are familiar, some are not. That's this group J. We want to explore it in more depth because this is the group to which these Jews belong. So they said one particular subgrouping of group J was heavily found in the self-identifying Jewish priesthood Jews. I'm putting this circle up here in Europe because the geographic location of many of the Jews in this study was Europe. They're part of the Jewish diaspora spreading out of peoples. Well, if you just look at group J in general, 85% of the Jews that they studied were found in group J. So could this be the echo then of Moses and Aaron? Very intriguing frequency. Let's look at group J now more broadly. Yes, it's found very high frequency in Jews. Where else is it found? Again, I'm using these circles like I did last time to represent the relative frequency of this lineage in these groups. So this large circle right here represents 85%. And so this represents the relative frequency in, in the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman, Yemen, so forth. And you can see it's, it's above 50%, 50% or higher in the Near East, in the Middle East, which seems to be consistent then with this being a Jewish lineage. And the frequency of this group J tends to decrease as you radiate outward from the Middle East. So go up to Turkey, to the Caucasus region. So this is what I'm talking about, Caucasus, just north of Iran, south here of modern Russia. The circles are smaller. It's lower frequency there. Then if you go into Europe, it's lower frequency, Balkans, Italy, Spain, and you can barely even see this dot up here in France and, and in the British Isles. It's virtually absent then for, as you go north in Europe. Well, in North Africa, you find it but with decreasing frequency as a general rule as you go west, small circle here in Morocco. If you go the other direction towards India, go eastward, found in Iran, Pakistan, India, but you can see the circles get progressively smaller. So it sort of has this bullseye location in the Middle East that decreases as you go outward. Well, that's very intriguing. If you go back to the family tree, and you say, when did this group J lineage begin? It has a very ancient origin, prior to 1000 BC. Also intriguing. Many in the creationist circles would put the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt around 1400s, 1500s. So to have a very ancient lineage. Okay, now, that, now this is getting very interesting. Let's go back to this paper, though, that claims... And, and is the basis for saying there is this Jewish lineage. They say 46% of these Kohanim self-identifying Jewish priesthood Jews belong to a subgroup of J. And they say this subgroup of J likely originated in the Near East well before the dispersal of Jewish groups in the diaspora. So part of the, the intrigue of this paper is the timing of this lineage. They say three to 4,000 years ago, you do the math in your head, okay, 
that goes back to maybe the time of Abraham. Could this be it? Well, here's a red flag. This is a mainstream scientific paper. Three to 4,000 years ago is relative. Relative to their time scale of hundreds of thousands of years of human history. So what is this actual date? We've seen that their hundreds of thousands of human history is inconsistent with the actual Y chromosome clock in the, the history we see in the Y chromosome, inconsistent with scripture. This is not a scientifically justifiable conclusion. It's mainstream, but not scientifically supported. So what's the actual date for this J-P58, this, this group they're calling the Jewish priestly lineage? Well, the actual date, if you run the math based on what we know from the Y chromosome clock, is the 14 to 1800s, which is far after Moses and Aaron lived. So why in the world would you have so many Jews that go back to a common ancestor in the 14 to 1800s? Well, the explanation really goes back to episodes one and two. It's the explanation that applies not just to Jews, but to so many other people groups around the globe. The shape of human population growth is hockey stick, fairly slow growth for several thousand years, and then it shoots up in the last few hundred. What that means practically, mathematically, not only do you have far fewer people to choose as a spouse back here as you do up here, what it means is the family trees collapse to common ancestors very quickly. There's been a 20-fold change in the global population size since 1400. In Europe, it's only, I think, closer to a 10-fold change. What that means then, and it's not intuitive, you have to go back to some of the previous episodes to see more discussion of this. 90% of the lineages in Europe today collapse back in the 1400s. So Jews, being in Europe, would follow the same mathematical principle. There's another sad factor at play, though, and that's the death of 6 million Jews in Europe due to the horrors of the Holocaust. Well, the death of millions of Jews also means the extinction of millions of lineages. And so the genetic diversity of the Jews in Europe drops as a result of the horrors of Nazi Germany. So this so-called Jewish lineage doesn't have a time frame that fits Moses and Aaron. Doesn't have a time frame that fits many of the arguments made in this paper. So let me take this off the screen momentarily and return to the question of what is this group J? Yes, it's found in Jews. Timing isn't quite what the paper claimed it was. What is the explanation though for this group J that seems to have a bullseye concentration in the Middle East? Could there still be something here that's related to the Jews? Surprisingly, one of the keys to understanding the history of this lineage comes from a study that didn't even sample the Middle East. This first study we looked at early on in these episodes, the Thousand Genomes Project, the one that sampled the major locations of where the people are, didn't even have lineages in the Middle East. Yet it did have members of group J. And this was historically in my own study of the Y chromosome, one of the first studies I examined and one of the first puzzles I had trouble solving. Group J in this study is heavily populated by, if you can just see the colors here, gold and green, Europeans, and peoples of South Asia. We'll zoom in here just momentarily so you can see them. Yes, you have peoples in the Americas, but again, I think this is carryover from Europe. Sadly, most Latin Americans have European ancestry, not indigenous American, because of the die off of these peoples after the arrival of Columbus. So even though they're gray here, Native American, so called Latin American, actually, this should be gray as well, this Colombian. But for that matter, that we could color them all likely gold as well because they're of European descent. So you have this European slash American group here. You can see Colombians, uh, Italians from Tuscany, Finnish peoples. Then you have some of the South Asians, Pakistanis, Gujaratis who are living in Houston, but trace their ancestry to India. Punjabis, Bengalis from Bangladesh, Indian Telugus, so forth. That's the major groups here in this group, J, because these are the peoples that were sampled. The British person here as well, Sri Lankans. That's, that's what you find here in group J. And I want to zoom back out so that you can see part of the big picture pattern here and a pattern that really stumped me when I first saw it. 
So this may be small at the screen you're looking at, but if you try to squint and see the colors, you'll see that there's a general grouping of gold slash gray. And I'm going to lump the gray in with the gold, basically a European subgroup here, and then an Indian South Asian subgroup here, and then another European subgroup here, and an Indian, they, they kind of alternate. They're not all intertwined. It's like there was a group that went off this direction and then off this direction. They share a common ancestor back here, but it's like whatever population they came from went their separate ways and stayed in Europe or stayed in South Asia thereafter. These clusters have common ancestors in the 700s to 1100s. And early on in my study of the Y chromosome, I thought, what in the world is this? Is this now evidence against the Y chromosome clock? I can't think of anything that connects these sections of the world together. And then I came across this study, the one we just mentioned, that has samples of the Middle East. And you can see in red here, there's a lot of red. I'm like, oh, OK, finally, this is the explanation. This must be why. Europe and India are connected. The connection must run through the Middle East. And the geography of J, or at least the, the fact that it runs through the Middle East, reminded me immediately of the Islamic conquest, beginning in the 600s AD with Muhammad and his followers, and eventually spread through North Africa, got into Europe. You can see it extends to the edge of India, is in Pakistan. Aha, this seems to fit then these clusters. But then I got stuck on the dates again, as you look, as I looked into this history more so. Yes, Muhammad and his followers, and the people thereafter, these Arab Muslims, got as far east and west as is shown here. But by the mid 800s, the eastern part of their empire began to be reconquered by Central Asian peoples. So that by the mid 800s, this part of the Islamic empire was being cut off from India. And before the time of Columbus, the 1100s, the Muslims were being pushed out of Spain. So if we're getting cut off here in the 800s from South Asia, how in the world do you connect this part of the world to this part of the world up into the 1100s? This is where I began to scratch my head again. Now what? How do you explain this? What's the history of Group J? How do you connect Europe and India? In fact, it turns out that this Europe-India connection was one of the keys to unraveling the surprising explanation for Group J, and by extension, a good chunk of the Jewish population in the world today. Let's go back to India, because this is where one of the keys to understanding it emerges. And let's work through the history of, the, of India from the present, working backwards. So the modern Indian state traces its origins to the 20th century where they throw off British rule. So you step back from the modern Indian state and you run into the British Raj, which rules from the 1800s onwards. They're here because the East India Company arrives in the 1600s. They arrive not to a British Raj, obviously, but to the Mughal Empire. And we discussed in previous episodes that the Mughal Empire comes from the Persian word for Mongol because this is of Mongol origin. Well, that's intriguing. However, neither of these historical events seems to be a good explanation for the connection between it, uh, India and Europe. For one, hardly any British peoples are in this J grouping. So that doesn't seem to fit. And the Mongols, even though we've already seen connections between Europe and South Asia due to the Mongols, the dates seem to be too late. Well, who precedes the Mughals? Mughals are preceded, at least in North India, by the Delhi Sultanate. By the name, you might start to think some sort of Muslim Islamic connection. Ethnically, though, if you look at the history books, this is not Arab Muslim in origin. It's, if anything, led by an Iranian type people, but the history books will talk about the Turkish invasion of India because. Many of the members of these armies, as well as some of the Arab armies, were manned by slaves. In Egypt especially, there were slaves who were being enlisted in the Muslim armies. And in the Iranian leadership, leading to the Delhi Sultanate, there were massive numbers of Turks as part of this army. And so 
history books will talk about the Turkish invasion of India that gave rise to the Delhi Sultanate. Well, 1200s, this is now much closer to the dates that are relevant. And what's even more intriguing is it's the Turks that are responsible for pushing the Arab Muslims back towards the Middle East. It's the Seljuk Turks who in the thousands AD are overrunning the Middle East. Now, if you're like me, you hear Turks and you think modern day Turkey. Their origins are actually here in Central Asia. And this history is part of the explanation for how they got to Turkey. This is 1000s AD. And again, a different group of Turks is now coming down into India 100 or so years later. So this split between these eventual Turkish peoples and those who come into India happens right around 1100 AD. Turks don't stay in the Middle East, though. They're overrun within a century or two by the world's greatest empire, the Mongols. Notice, though, that even though the Mongols skirt India and essentially cut off this part of the world from India, and of course conquer much of Central Asia, get into Eastern Europe, get into the Middle East, they don't quite conquer all of Turkey, and the Turkish peoples persist in Western Turkey. And in fact, they throw off the Mongols and begin to reconquer again and last for several hundred years under the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which rules, notice here, parts of Europe, the Balkan Peninsula, they're in the Middle East, parts of North Africa, and they're in both Middle East and in Europe for several hundred years. They're in one or the other for longer than this. Of course, they're in Turkey in the 1300s, Notice, though, that they're, they're in the Middle East into the 1900s. Think back to history that might be more familiar. World War I, they're one of the World War I powers, the Ottoman Empire down here. You can see some of the other perhaps more familiar entities during World War I up in this map. My point is the highlight here, Turkish people here right into the modern era, and they're connecting Europe down here. And the connection of the Turkish people to India goes back to the split between the Seljuks and whoever these other Turkish people were going back in the Delhi Sultanate back in the 1100s. So notice how the realm of the Ottoman Empire getting down into the Middle East, and again, this is, this is eventually cut off. Go back to the previous slide here. You can see how much it's decreased by the 1900s, but it's still extending down here to the Middle East. This has a very intriguing geographic echo in the concentration of Group J in the Middle East and elsewhere today. The Ottoman Empire seems to explain the concentration today and the history of the Turks seems to explain why we can have connections here and here. And the lack of a heavy Turkish presence in either of these places in recent history might explain why it's such a low concentration there. It fits the timing of the splits in these, in, in these clusters. And here's how, just to make it clearer why. Why would there be a Turkish connection to Europe in the 700s? Because I said there's, there's some clusters here that separate in the 700s. Well, recall from previous episodes that there's a steady stream of Central Asian peoples into Europe from the 500, 700s. And one of the 700s peoples is a Turkish group. The Oguz peoples moving into, from Central Asia into Europe are Turkish peoples. But not the only Turkish peoples. There are Turkish people who stuck around Central Asia and became then part of the Turkish armies that came into India. These are not the only Turkish people. There was a split between whoever these people were and the Seljuk Turks in the thousands. So that would explain the 1100 split as they go this way. And these are the Seljuk Turks go this way. And these two groups are separated by the arrival of the Mongols and those who persist in modern day geographic Turkey expand after the arrival and throw off the Mongol yoke and have this empire that persists in the Middle East up until the modern time. So let's watch this history again with one map to make it even clearer because the Turkish peoples, in my view, are the best explanation at present for this group J, not Arab Muslims. So these peoples, even though I, again, I think Turkey as Turkish peoples as here, Yet history, their origin is not there. It's in Central Asia in the 600s. Turkish people arise in Central Asia in the 600s. Some of these people begin migrating to Europe in the 700s, which is why I think we see some of the echo in the splits between Europe, Europeans and Indian peoples 
at that point in time. There's another split that happens, the Seljuk Turks, which give rise then to the modern Turkish peoples, around the thousands. But there's still Turkish peoples left over. The split happens in the thousands, and those who are still left over move down then and are invading part of the armies that invade India in the 1200s. I mentioned the last episode talking about the Vikings, that there's this general rule of thumb that seems to emerge in the human family tree, that last empire standing wins. Yes, you might invade and take over, but if there's some people group that comes in after you and then wipes you out, they're the group that's going to be dominant today. So, yes, they arrive in Europe in the 700s, but there's many other peoples who arrive after them. So they're a minority of European peoples today. The peoples in India, we saw that they, the Delhi Sultanate is followed by the Mughal Empire, the Mongols. And so they're not the last empire standing, they're a minority of India today. Even the Seljuk Turks, as they pass through the Middle East, are not the last empire standing. The Mongols march through here, and after the Mongols are other Iranian peoples who then rise. And so they're not the major grouping in this part of the world today, not even in the Middle East, because the Turkish people here are followed by the Mongol conquest. So the Turks are pushed into modern day geographic Turkey as a result of the Mongol conquest, but then they begin reconquering again and become the last empire standing in other parts of the world. They move into Europe, but eventually push back out. They move into parts of North Africa, and perhaps more importantly for our study, they're in the Middle East for several centuries, right up until the modern era, when the modern Muslim countries, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, emerge today. This history of the Turks seems to find a very strong echo in the geographic extent of Group J today. So who are the Jews? Who are modern day Jewish people? Well, it seems that the, the section, I should say, a, a, a subsection of modern Jews, along with many other Middle Eastern peoples, and some Europeans, like Greeks and other Balkan Peninsula folks, and Italians, and even some Spaniards at a low percentage, and even some Indians, all share a common Turkish heritage. They trace some of their origins to Central Asia. Not all of these people, but if you're in the Middle East, a heavy percentage of you do chase, trace your origins via Group J to the Turkish people. And what we've seen in this episode is, once again, Central Asia seems to play this dominant role in the world history of peoples. We've seen other Central Asian lineages, R1A, R1B, due to Mongols, Magyars. Well, here the Turkish people are showing up in the Middle East. They have a dominant presence. They're about a quarter of the peoples in India. The fingers of Central Asia, even though they don't necessarily occupy much attention in the history of Western civilization, politically, they don't play a huge role in Europe. But in terms of their DNA, massive echo in Europe, in the Middle East, significant imprint in India, and even now in North Africa. But could there still be an ancient Jewish lineage that we haven't yet discussed or haven't yet discovered? Could we find the Mosaic lineage, going back to Moses and Aaron, David, Solomon? Hope you join us in future episodes to find out this is the new history of the human race, new windows into our past that we haven't been able to see before. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I think the COVID-19 situation has greatly benefited <laughs> historical <laughs> research and genetics because you've been stuck at home, devouring history books, locked away. We'll have to do that with you more often, Nathaniel. <laughs> it's been very productive. <laughs> so that's one of the positive outcomes of all of this, to lock you away and just give you those history books and the genetics research and say, go to it. And of course, you already had the tools, having a PhD from Harvard in biology. You've already done a lot of research in genetics. And so equipped with those tools and the mind the Lord has given you, I'm just amazed. So what do we have in 19 and 20? some really crazy conclusions, some of which I just reached this past week where I'm sitting in my basement, in my guest room and saying, no way, this can't be true. We haven't, we're not done with the Muslims. 
uh, we're not done with the echo of the Arab Muslim conquest. And we haven't even touched Africa or Egypt. So episode 19 will be Mysteries of Ancient Africa. And there's some crazy connections to the Arab world that may flow through ancient Egypt. And so I'm still blown away by some of the things that have emerged this past week. And we're going to open that box in episode 19, looking at the whole sweep of sub-Saharan African history. What is the history of dark-skinned peoples? How does this relate to ancient Egypt? How does this relate to the Middle East? How does this relate to linguistics? It, it's stuff that I wouldn't have predicted, but again, it, it, I, I looked at myself and I thought, no way, this is crazy. So just a teaser then for that. In episode 20, we'll finally go back to some of the earliest stages, but we'll begin with scripture. And, these are, and what I'm calling this currently is neglected biblical clues. Now, if you're like me and if, and if you follow answers in Genesis, you should first say, hold on. And, and anyone should be suspicious when someone says, well, I've got, some, I've got some clues from scripture we've missed. I'm suspicious if I say, I've got clues from scripture we've missed. But I think there's some things that, that uh, come from the text, not read into the text, but come out of the text. And I think part of the reason I've missed this is because these are clues that aren't necessarily points of major departure from mainstream science. We talk about the seven seas of history because these are the major points at which mainstream science says no. And so we push back and, and say, this is what scripture says, stand on this, and these are the conclusions you reach. And we stand there. Well, there's some other clues that I won't yet give away that follow from Genesis 1 through 11 and the rest of scripture that are highly relevant to human history and understanding some of the earliest time points and that may actually have some echoes then in the Y chromosome family tree that I never expected to see. So lots more in store next week and that, that may even change and give us and fill out even more of the biblical framework by which to approach anthropology, the history of the human race. You know what? It sounds like the event of the Tower of Babel, Noah's flood and the ark, going back to Adam within a 6,000 year time frame it all makes sense. It makes tremendous sense. And there may be even more echoes that, that are hiding in our DNA if we have the right framework in which to approach them and say, oh, never expected to see that, but boom, there it is. So that'll be episode 20. And a book will come out of this in 2021. And that won't just cause some echoes. That'll cause thunder through <laughs> the anthropology world and through through the world of Christians who compromise God's word with evolutionary chronology is going to thunder through them too. Anyway, so how many more episodes altogether? Were you going to wind it up after 20? Probably through 26. So just a preview then of what follows thereafter. It'll be Neanderthals in 21, probably the cradles of civilization in 22. And then we might spend one or two episodes saying now that we've got all these tools in hand, let's tell the sweeping panorama of human history anew from start to finish with these new clues and see the picture that emerges. And then we'll probably conclude with maybe an episode or two on, well, what about all this other mainstream scientific evidence? What, what about the criticism? What, what about human chimp common ancestry? Many of these other popular arguments from genetics that try to deny the history we've just explored and then conclude with, how do I apply this to me? If I've taken a genetic test, what does this mean? How can I find out if I'm connected to the Persians, to the ancient Egyptians, to the pharaohs, to the Vikings. What can we do practically with the tools that we have out there? And what could AIG do as an aid to help people find out who exactly they came from and to tell their own stories? Wow, so another eight more episodes. So two more next week, 19 and 20, and then another six episodes after that. Oh, it seems like it's going for millions of years, but actually, <laughs> Once we finish this, it'll seem like we've gone for about 6,000 years. <laughs> exactly. Well, if you missed out on the earlier programs, I encourage you to subscribe to our streaming service, Answers.tv. A year subscription is just over $3 a month, and you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Answers in Genesis videos, programs, our live streaming, our future conferences, also videos from Living Waters. We've got some other organizations and special guest speakers that are going to be putting programs up on answers.tv. 
And of course, all of these programs are there on answers.tv. So thank you, Dr. Jensen, and we look forward to episodes 19 and 20 next week. Thank you.